Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, I'm very glad to have with us James Bowen. James completed his master's at the University of Birmingham in England, where he spent a year working at GSK in medicinal chemistry. His final year was spent investigating gold-catalyzed polycyclization cascades of inamids for the synthesis of 3D scaffolds under the supervision of Dr. Paul Davies, for which he was awarded the Alfred Bader Prize. James moved to the University of Bristol in 2018 to join the chemical synthesis CDT, where he undertook two-month rotations in the labs of Christine Willis, Alistair Lennox, and Paul Pringle. James returned to the Willis Group, where he's now a final year PhD student investigating the biosynthesis of polyketa natural products. And with that, I'll let you get started, James. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for the introduction, Matthew, and for the kind invitation to talk about my work on this awesome platform. As Matthew said, my name is James, and I'm a final year PhD student in the Willis Group at the University of Bristol, and I will be discussing my recent total synthesis of Ambrotizin J. The Ambrotizins are a family of polyketide natural products originally isolated from the gliding bacteria Polyangium cellulosum in 1977. They have an interesting structure which contains three defined ring systems, a tetrahydropyran, cyclopropane, and dihydropyran. The main variation in the family comes at the C5 position, which could be an alcohol, its epimer, or an amine at various states of oxidation and methylation. Whilst the structure of the amortizins themselves inspired numerous groups to attempt their total syntheses, it was the biological properties which made researchers take notice. When tested against a range of fungal pathogens, the ambrotysins exhibited potent antifungal activity. Importantly, they showed no toxicity in mammals. As a group, we are interested in understanding how nature synthesizes complex natural products in order to aid us in the development of novel synthetic methodologies. We also hope to harness nature's biological machinery to develop novel biocatalysts to perform challenging synthetic transformations in a green and efficient manner. In particular, we have been investigating THP formation in amortizing biosynthesis. THPs are important fragments found in numerous natural products and drug molecules. This is emphasized by the fact that they are the sixth most common ring system in all FDA approved drugs. So if we take a closer look at the proposed THP biosynthesis in the amortizins. Gene knockout studies indicate that the flavin-dependent monooxygenase AMBJ is responsible for THP formation from the intermediate amortizin J. AMBJ shows homology to epoxidases in other biosynthetic pathways. It therefore stands to reason that AMBJ epoxidizes amortisin J, which then undergoes epoxide ring opening to form amortisin F. However, you can envisage an alternative ring closure to afford the THF product, but this is not seen in any wild type cultures. Since no epoxide hydrolase has been identified in the amortisin biosynthetic pathway, it begs the interesting question. Does AMBJ have a unique role as not only an epoxidase, but also an epoxide hydrolase? To investigate this, we wish to conduct in vitro assays with AMBJ and the putative biosynthetic intermediate amortizing J. For this, we need sufficient quantities of amortizing J, and to access this, we turn to total synthesis. Retrosynthetically, we envisaged we could construct amortizing J by duly Kachensky alternation to give this aldehyde and this sulfone. These could be assembled by a suzuki mara cross-coupling to give this vinyl iodide and this vinyl pronic ester, and a second olefination. We hoped this highly modular route would provide rapid access to amortization J and facilitate the formation of analogues for substrate specificity studies on AMBJ. Furthermore, we hope to synthesize analogues of the amortizins with improved biological activities. In a forward sense, we began with the synthesis of the vinyl iodide. Initially, an asymmetric aldol condensation with this thiazolidine thion auxiliary provided the aldol adduct in a moderate yield due to poor diastereoselectivity. selectivity. This poor selectivity can be rationalized by looking at the transition state of the reaction, where selectivity is in part controlled by the ability for the aldehyde to orientate the R group in an equatorial position. However, in our case, due to the relatively small steric bulk of the alkyne, the energy difference between orientation in the axial versus the equatorial position was small, and therefore poor selectivity was observed. But I'll come back to this later to show how we solve this issue. The next step was a decarboxylative Claisen condensation, which was followed by a Narazaka-Prazad reduction and subsequent protection as the acetonide. 
Unfortunately, we found that silyl deprotection under a variety of conditions afforded a low yield of the desired terminal alkyne. This was due to the formation of various elimination products. This result should have been really foreshadowing potential issues in the future. However, for the time being, we proceeded to convert the alkyne to the desired vinyl iodide. With the vinyl iodide in hand, we turned our attention to the arguably more interesting cyclopropane. To construct the cyclopropane fragment, we opted to utilize some methodology developed by Taylor in Notre Dame, where homolytic alcohols, such as these, were activated by triflic and hydride to form the desired cyclopropanes. We therefore required this homolytic alcohol, which we proposed could be synthesized by an asymmetric allylation between this chiral allyl boronate and this aldehyde. The allyl chiral boronate was synthesized from a pinane diol derived bronic ester by a Madsen homologation followed by in situ trapping with a Grignard reagent. The corresponding aldehyde was readily accessed from ethylene glycol. Pleasingly, the planned allylation proceeded smoothly, providing the desired homolytic alcohol in excellent yield as a single diastereoisomer. Initially, we were pleased to find that activation of the homolytic alcohol with triflic hydride afforded the cyclopropane product in a 56% yield, but also 24% of the silated starting material. Now, this was not a huge issue, as it could be deprotected in quantitative yield to return the starting material, which could be fed back into the reaction. However, we wanted to avoid this side product, as it's not ideal. So how could this silated product be formed? If we start by taking a look at the reaction mechanism, First, the alcohol is activated with triflic and hydride, and this then undergoes cyclization via the transition state to afford the cyclopropane product alongside TMS triflate as a byproduct. Now, it's clear that if there is a buildup of TMS triflate in the presence of starting material, then competitive silylation will be an issue, in particular if activation of the alcohol is slow relative to cyclization. So, the crude way we managed to solve this problem was to increase the rate of addition of triflic and hydride, which resulted in an excellent yield of the desired product as a single diastereoisomer on a reasonable scale. Having formed the cyclopropane, we completed the synthesis of this fragment by dihydroxylation and cleavage of the diol, CFF Gilbert homologation with the Hero Vestman reagent, deprotection of the alcohol, and finally hydroboration catalyzed by the Schwartz reagent. With both fragments in hand, we attempted the proposed suzuki mara cross-coupling. Unfortunately, this is where we should have anticipated some issues, as applying conditions with a variety of sodium and potassium bases resulted in no evidence of product formation and a complex reaction mixture due to elimination products. We therefore decided to change our strategy and remove this issue of E1CB elimination by synthesizing this vinyl iodide containing the protected triol. This was accessed in a similar manner to the route I previously described. However, we started with an asymmetric aldol with this more sterically bulky aldehyde, which afforded the aldol adduct in an improved yield. A decarboxylated cliosin condensation and subsequent reduction afforded the syndial, which could be protected, reduced, and further protected to afford the protected trial in 73% yield over three steps with only a single purification. Frustratingly, we found that the conversion of the vinyl silane to the corresponding vinyl iodide was challenging, and we were only able to achieve a maximum yield of 55% in a 2 to 1 ratio of E to Z isomers. We were also observing formation of an undesired side product. And after bashing our heads against the wall for some time, we finally found some conditions developed by Sato, which cleanly converted the vinyl silane to the vinyl iodide in two steps, affording the desired product as a single isomer. Now for me, I found this step particularly interesting, and it's proposed that ring opening of the epoxy silane by lithium tributyl tin affords this intermediate, which can undergo Peterson olefination and subsequent tin iodine exchange. So now with the new vinyl iodide in hand, we attempt the Suzuki Mara cross-coupling again. And we were pleased to find that the Suzuki proceeded smoothly and after oxidation provided the desired aldehyde an excellent yield over the two steps. We found that thallium carbonate was an excellent base for this reaction, albeit toxic, as it facilitated shorter reaction times and low temperatures, preventing any degradation products such as cyclopropane ring opening. Having synthesized the aldehyde, we set our sights on the desired sulfone, which will be used in the Julie-Kachensky olefination. 
to construct the sulfur, we turn to some work by Hanassian and Marco, where the phosphorus diamide was constructed using our Rochester in four simple steps. The ketone fragment, on the other hand, was synthesized by a multi-component asymmetric saccharide reaction developed by Marco during the total synthesis of the drangolids. This intermediate can then be readily converted to the ketone by ring-closing metaphysis, deprotection, and finally oxidation. The two fragments were then coupled to afford the tri-substituted olefin as a 7 to 1 mixture of isomers, which could be deprotected and converted to the sulfone under standard conditions. Gratifyingly, the envisaged olefination provided the transalkene in a 61% yield using standard Julia conditions of KHMDS and DCE at minus 60 degrees to room temperature, which completed the carbon skeleton of amortitian J. The synthesis was then completed by global deprotection, selective oxidation of the primary alcohol to the lactone, and finally mild hydrolysis to yield amortitian J in a 4% yield over 14 steps longest linear sequence and a painstaking 44 total steps. Having now synthesized amortitian J, we are currently conducting in vivo and in vitro assays with AMBJ and hope to develop the enzyme into a biocatalyst for THP formation. Furthermore, we wish to use this highly modular synthesis to generate analogues of the amortitions with improved biological activity. So thank you all for listening and making it to the end of my talk. I really now just want to finish by thanking the Willis Group, who throughout this project put up with my incessant complaining when things weren't going well, which, trust me, was quite often. I would also like to thank my supervisors, Professors uh, Chris Willis and Matt Crump, for all their advice and mentoring. And just a special thanks to Dr. Loy Wang, who's been an amazing co-worker and just really helped me get to grips with the biological techniques which are involved in this project and which I can hope to talk to you about soon. Thanks to the EPSRC for funding and the Bristol Chemical Synthesis CDT for providing an excellent training program. And finally, thank you again, Matthew, for inviting me to talk today. I think this is an excellent platform and I encourage everyone to take a look at the content. If you have any questions, then feel free to contact me by email or LinkedIn. Thank you very much again for listening. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to James for sharing your work with us. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.